Welcome. Welcome, Professor Peter Hayes. Welcome to the Norwegian Center for Holocaust and Minority Studies. Are you there, over there? I am there, thank you very much for inviting me. We truly appreciate you taking the time to talk with a Norwegian audience or any audience all over the world. That is the world these days, you know. As we speak, where are you, Peter Hayes? I'm in my home office in Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, Illinois. How is uh, the spring coming on in Chicago? It's, it's a gorgeous spring in Chicago. Actually, today we have 15 degrees, uh, according to the European system, and bright sunshine. The daffodils have begun to bloom, Ooh. so it's a, it's, a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful season right now. Good. Today, uh, Mr. Hayes, uh, you are Professor Emeritus at Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern University. And you have been for five years chairman of the Academic Committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And uh, to us at the Norwegian Holocaust Center, it's, you, you're actually a person we read and we do admire. And your impressive work at Northwestern began in 1980, where you were a professor of history and German for 20 years. And then from 2000 on, until you retired in 2016, you were the Theodor Zewais Holocaust Educational Foundation Professor. And your background, your education includes degrees from Baudan, Oxford and Yale Universities. And, and I hope we can talk a little bit about that today, up your sleeve is your 14th book, Analyzing German Big Business During the Third Reich. But today, however, we will focus on this book, why? Why Explaining the Holocaust, a book you wrote in 2017 for an audience that, you know, didn't know so much, a lay audience. And New York Times actually called this book, quote, an intellectually searching and wide-ranging study of the Holocaust in a modest didactic form. Quote, ending. That's not bad. That's impressive in New York Times. Thanks. And to the audience following us today, this hour, the plan is the following. First, Professor Hayes will give a short talk and then we'll have a conversation. So, Peter Hayes, from Chicago, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, you know, the review in the New York Times used a word that um, perhaps I, I, I'm going to say something contradictory now, used a word that made me very proud. And the word was modest. I wrote a book that was not thesis driven that was not designed to show that I saw something that no historian before me had ever seen, but was rather a book to explain to people the complexities of a subject around which many myths have grown up. I realized when I was coming up toward my retirement in 2016, that my teaching career had prepared me to write a new kind of history of the Holocaust, not a narrative history, the way many people, Shaw Friedlander, uh, David Cesarani, Lawrence Reese, many other people have written very fine narrative histories that tell the story of the Holocaust from beginning to end. I wanted to write something that was um, sharper and more analytical rather than narrative. And I could do that because I taught at a university in America that had a, has an academic calendar that for us is rather unusual. Uh, it's more like what happens at Oxford or Cambridge where you have three short, relatively short terms. I had to teach the history of the Holocaust, which I did for 25 times during my uh, teaching career. I had to teach the subject within basically nine weeks. It is a very difficult subject to compress into nine weeks. The story is more complicated. There are a lot of fascinating byways to explore. And it took me a few years to figure out how to do that, how to adapt what I knew about the subject for students in a manageable framework. What I came up with was to address a single question each week questions that I knew the students brought to the class when they enrolled in it. And I knew this because I had <clears throat> tried to teach in a narrative form for several years. It had not worked, but I had learned what the students most cared about. 
and over a, a period of trial and error, it took maybe three or four years after that, I developed a system of asking one question every week. Why the Jews? Why the Germans? Why murder? Why was it so swift and sweeping? Which is in itself a subject that many people don't understand. The Holocaust was an incredibly compressed process, both temporally and spatially. The three quarters of the Jews of Europe who died in the Holocaust died within 20 months. Half of them died within 11 months. A quarter of them, a million and a half people, died within roughly three months. Uh, so this, it, it, these were the questions that, that I wanted to address and show people how to answer these, these questions. And, and that involved also a task that I think a history professor has, uh, in addition to the substance of what you teach, you have to model for students how to understand something historically. And so this framework of a question a week with me addressing these questions in lectures and the readings that they had uh, to supplement those lectures providing additional focus, this became the way that I structured the course. And as I got to the end of my teaching career, I realized that that might indeed be something of interest to, a, to the, the interested general reader because after all that audience corresponds to the kinds of students I was addressing who were not necessarily history majors or specialists. They were people who were curious about this subject. Now, the, and then there was an additional purpose to the book. And that was that I think many people have become paralyzed in the face of the Holocaust. The enormity of the horror is so difficult to grasp that people tend to flee into a sense that it is unfathomable, um, inexplicable, incomprehensible. And I think that that's either true of every event in history or true of no event in history. Anything that human beings do is either understandable and describable to each other, or it is not. It is fundamentally unknowable. Intentions are, are difficult to grasp and so forth. And it has to be a working assumption of any historical process, I think, that you are trying to get to the bottom of why and how it happened. And that the answers to that can never be final. We will always learn new things that will upset our previous understandings. Just this week, there was a book published in Austria, which is a biography of Adolf Hitler's father. And it tells us from some newly discovered letters in an Austrian attic that Hitler's intense nationalism and his intense anti-Semitism did not come from nowhere. These were the views that his father held. And so Mein Kampf may have misled us in telling us that Hitler arrived at these convictions himself out of his experiences in Vienna and during World War I. And this is a very up-to-date illustration of how we always learn new things. And they cause us to revise our previous explanations of how and why things happened. Nonetheless, we are always obligated to do the best we can with what we have at any given moment. So I tried to write a book that shows people how we can do the best we can with what we know about this subject at the moment. And there was one other motivation for this book that sprang out of my teaching career, and that was the, the arc of that career. Um, I began teaching a lecture course on the Holocaust in 1988. It was, I had come to Northwestern as a historian of modern Germany, and most of what I taught was about German history in the broader sense. But I began teaching a lecture course devoted to the Holocaust in 1988. And when I started teaching in the early years, I realized my students came into that classroom knowing a fair amount about World War II, and particularly the American role in World War II, but not very much about the Holocaust. And by the time I ended my teaching career in 2016, the situation had reversed. My students came into the class thinking they knew a lot about the Holocaust from 
films and, and um, the Diary of Anne Frank and various things that were part of the culture. But they didn't know much about World War II. And they could not embed the subject of what had been done to the Jews in the larger framework of what else was happening. And that inability to embed meant that they harbored a lot of misconceptions about the temporal and the spatial compression, for instance. I mean, after all, uh, most American students came to the subject thinking of the Holocaust as something that happened in Germany or to Anne Frank in hiding in Holland. Uh, they forget the fact that three quarters of the victims of the Holocaust came from only three countries. And those countries were much further away, Poland, Lithuania, and the Soviet Union. So I realized that this might also be true of the public perception of the Holocaust, that Americans might be losing an ability to contextualize it and to explain it in the broader framework, and that my book might be able to provide that. So those were the objectives that I set out to try to achieve. Um, I've been very gratified. I don't know about uh, foreign language sales. The book has been translated into Spanish and German and Slovak, and I and is it has it is not published in Polish. Um, but the English language edition has sold over thirty thousand copies, and so I think there has been some connection between what I hope to achieve and what the audience would like to receive. And we do read your book in Norway. Uh, we read it in English. And, uh, well, 30,000 copies, not, not bad for an historian. No, uh, no. Nope, nope. Absolutely. So thank you, uh, Professor Hayes. Um, it is tempting to use your very sharp and pedagogical um, approach. As, why the Jews? And why the Germans? Could I challenge you to give us to the audience in a brief way, the way you've done in your fabulous book? Well, when we deal with the question of why the Jews, we have to start with an embedded tradition in Western civilization, which is primarily a, a tradition received from the fact that the unifying principle of Western civilization was Christianity for many centuries. And Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism. It's, after all, a religion that took the central ideas of Judaism, covenant, scripture, um, uh, and, and then and, and monotheism, and then turned them around. Monotheism became a single God with three parts, the Trinity. Scripture became the New Testament as well as the Old. Covenant became not something that was made between a particular people and God, but between all who accepted the gospel, the new, the good news, and those and that God. So Christianity descended, if you will, from Judaism, but modified it. And then Christianity was a proselytizing religion. It wanted to spread and win converts and take and take in people. And the Jews were the people who said no. They said, thank you very much. We have a covenant. We have scripture. We have our notion of monotheism. We do not accept you as a new and improved version on us, but rather we wish to retain our traditions. In the early years of Christianity, um, this was an affront. This was a rejection. And St. Augustine laid down the notion of witness that uh, Jews are a people who once had had a special relationship with the Lord and they therefore must be allowed to survive. But they have rejected the new relationship with the Lord that we have offered, so they must, be, they must be made to suffer. And this was the fundamental relationship between Christianity and Judaism for centuries, from the time that the Roman Empire became the, uh, the, the Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire, until the time that Christianity split in the Reformation. And then for several centuries further, until secular movements began to erode on, on the dominant ideas of Christianity in Western culture. That's the long heritage that is embedded in the tradition of seeing Jews as separate, in some ways threatening, potentially contaminating. And the contaminating meaning undermining the faith of Christians. And that's why they were confined to ghettos. That's why they were confined to certain occupations. 
They had to be kept at arm's length. And then with the rise of the enlightenment and secular ideals came the notion that Jews should be emancipated from these restrictions, should be allowed to become citizens like anyone else and to contribute to the body politic like anyone else. This led to the, the irony of the 19th century in the European world and, and the offshoots of the European world. Mainly that, namely that opportunities were opened wide to Jews. They were allowed to go to university. They were allowed to become professors. They were allowed to become uh, leading economic figures. They were allowed to become lawyers and doctors. Things that historically had been forbidden to them, they could do. And this meant that the 19th century was a time of advancement and prosperity for many Jews. It was also a time of adversity for many other people because the advances of industrialization replaced many old handicraft activities. Uh, there were segments of the population whose prestige was gradually declining while Jewish opportunities were opening, clergymen in particular, aristocrats in some places, so on. What, what, meant, what that all meant was that a backlash, a backlash arose against Jewish emancipation. And this created social groups that were an audience for agitators who said, you see, things are going wrong for you while they're going right for them. There's a causal relationship there. Your misfortune is their advantage. Their advantage might be the cause of your misfortune. And therefore, anti-Semitic political parties arose and so forth, constantly saying, Anything that is wrong in our current society can be improved by putting the Jews back in their confinement. So that's the story of why the Jews become an object of hostility. And, the, and this becomes particularly intense after World War I, partly because there are nations, whole nations now who see themselves as afflicted, and partly because there is a new menace on the scene, Bolshevism, which anti-Semitic agitators link to Jews. And this creates, and this expands the audience for anti-Semites in, in, who are agitating and writing books and selling newspapers. And so that audience becomes much more menacing to Jews in the early 20th century than, they, than it was in the 19th. But then the next qu big question or we should make it simple because we are in a tight schedule, but uh, why the Germans? Because that is really a topic in your study and you've been a professor of German history for decades. I mean, this is really your field. Well, we can start with what is not the explanation. It is not true that Germans were uniquely or more intensely anti-Semitic than other nations in Europe. Uh, it, it, the, the Goldhagen notion that Germans had been steeped in hundreds of years of anti-Semitic teaching, it's, it's not untrue, it's just that this is not particularly German. There were many other anti-Semitic movements in many other countries that were equally intense. And the, the answer to why the Germans is, is a short-term answer. It's what was happening in Germany after World War I. Because before World War I, there were many anti-Semitic political parties in Germany that ran for office. They never got more than 5% of the seats in parliament or 4.5% of the vote in a parliamentary election from 1870 until 1912. Indeed, in the early part of the 1920s, um, there was a rise in anti-Semitism, but it was not... Uh, a vehicle for the Nazi party, it was a vehicle for the German Nationalist Party. Now, by the end of the 1920s, however, at the beginning of the 1930s, Germans were voting in large numbers for a political party that if they knew anything about that political party, they knew it was intensely anti-Semitic. And they didn't really care. Anti-Semitism was not so much the engine that drove the Nazis to power, but it was not a barrier to them achieving power. And thus, when they came to power in 1933, they had basically convinced roughly a third of the Germans that Nazism was the answer 
to their problems. That didn't necessarily mean that that third of the Germans who voted for them voted for them because they were anti-Semites. Many of the Germans voted for them because the political system was in paralysis. There was no majority in the parliament. It was a stalemate. Others voted for them because the country had been in depression for four years and no other political party had offered a convincing answer to the depression. So the sense was, let's give them a turn. So all of these things came together in a striking way. But there's one more answer to why the Germans, and that is, of course, what, not what happened before 1933, not what brought Hitler to power, but what Hitler did with power um, and how it changed the country. And um, as you mentioned, I've been working on a book on um, German corporations and the Nazis, and this is a longstanding interest of mine. I've written two books about German chemical companies in the Nazi uh in the Nazi period, one was IG Farben, which was a giant uh, firm, and another was, and the other was called Degusa. Neither of these companies exist any longer, um, but they were partners in one particular enterprise. Uh, they made a substance called Zyklon, which um, became in the Holocaust, the gas that was used to kill Jews at Auschwitz. Now, I, I mention this under the heading, Why the Germans? Because this, these two companies provide a microcosm of the transformation of Germany by the Nazis. In 1933, when Hitler came into power, the boards of directors of these two companies did not contain a single member of the Nazi party. The leaders of these two companies were afraid of Nazi economic policies. They thought that they were not gonna be good for business. By 1943, both of these two companies are deeply embedded in Nazi crimes. They are co-producing poison gas. They are both employing thousands of slave laborers. And their boards of directors consist of roughly 50% members of the Nazi party. What happened between 1933 and 1943? All of the propaganda, all of the victories of Nazism and so forth transformed the behavior of people within the country. And people who had not been overtly anti-Semitic in 1933 were doing highly anti-Semitic things by 1943. So, so the Germans, it's partly to do with the crisis that opened the way for an ideological movement to dominate society. And then the way in which that ideological movement stamped out any dissent and created an environment of conformity. Another of your vies, why did Poland become the epicenter of the Holocaust, the, of the industrial genocide? Two reasons. Uh, the first one will sound almost flippant because that's where the Jews were. There were three million Jews in Poland. It was the most, uh, it was the most thickly populated nation in the world with Jews. And, therefore, and then the second reason is because those Jews were in the space that the Nazis thought of as their first colonial sphere. There, this was to be where living space would be, Lebensraum. And these people therefore were astride German expansionism. If you believed as the Nazis centrally believed that Jews were saboteurs, they were so they were intensely, the, the Nazis believed that Jews would always be trying to undermine the German effort and German victory. Therefore, they had to be, as the Nazis said, entfernt, removed. And Poland was the first place, aside from the Reich itself, that they conquered, which had a large Jewish population. And they felt this had to be, this had to be eliminated from their path because that population now fell behind German lines as, it, as Germany expanded into the Soviet Union. And, since, and these were potential guerrilla fighters. It was all an, an elaborate fantasy. It had very little basis in reality, but they believed it. And that is what led to the decision to have to wipe these people out because they couldn't remove them any other way. They couldn't send them anywhere else because they, they had not defeated the Soviet Union. They, had, they were blockaded at sea the, by the British, and therefore they, they run out of alternatives, or alternative ways of removing, and so they decide to kill. 
Today, uh, time witnesses are scarce, uh, dying the people in the 90s. Is it possible for people today? You have met so many students, you, met, you, talk, you talk to so many audiences. Is it possible for us to grasp, to understand what life in the ghettos and the camps really is like? You know, the word to understand is so difficult. Um, what does it mean? I certainly think that most of my students could not feel, and I can't feel, because I have never been subjected to that kind of treatment, what it was like day in and day out in the ghettos and the camps. But it may be possible, and we certainly have to try, to imagine ourselves into it. Uh, and because that is a, a, an act of human solidarity that we must constantly try to achieve. That is also a responsibility, I think. It is, yeah, very definitely. And I think, and that's not only true about the past, it's also true <clears throat> about refugee camps in the present, for instance. And um, <clears throat> the, the displaced people all over the world or the people who are interned all over the world. And it is, our, it is our responsibility as human beings to try to understand, because the, the, the great horror of Nazism is it taught people not to understand. It taught people not to feel like others. It taught people that you are only supposed to care about us, no one else. And that was the central teaching of Nazism. Um, so we, we fight that in, in that we argue that we should all try to solidarize and make an intellectual or an emotional effort to understand why this, what this subject has to teach us. And you know, Elie Wiesel told us, if, you're a, if you have listened to a time witness, you're yourself a witness. And I think that is really important. We are all witnesses. Teaching right. at a Holocaust Center, doing research at the Holocaust Center, having educational programs. You have had educational programs with students. That's a responsibility. Absolutely. And, and the, <clears throat> this is a subject that is so emblematic of other crises in human history. It seems to reach us partly because, as I began, I talked about the Western world, and this is something that happened in the Western world. It happened in cultures and countries that think of themselves as civilized and cultured. And that is why this, this particular form of human abuse addresses us so fundamentally. And you know, there is a discussion in many countries, I think, what could we have done? If, if you, where you, where there, there were people uh, telling the story, there were, in New York Times, you, you could read about the genocide in all sorts of articles that they were doing research. And in Norway, we're discussing what could the government in exile really do? Why didn't they listen? What, did, what could they do? So I have to ask you, Professor Hayes, uh, was there anything countries outside Germany could have done, the allies, before the war, during the war, that could have substantially made it possible for more Jews to survive? Before the war, certainly. Before the war, particularly the United Kingdom and the United States could have allowed more refugees in. Um, the irony of the American policy is, of course, the United States let in more refugee Jews from Europe than any other country. But the amount was no way commensurate with the problem. And we had all kinds of people in the United States using ar arguments against letting in Jewish refugees that we now hear against letting in refugees from Latin America, identical arguments. Um, so we could have done more, the, the United Kingdom could have done more. The United Kingdom let in very few people except in the last, uh, in, except in the months after Kristallnacht, after the Norway Pope. also received too few. I mean, it's a discussion also here. I mean, there's so many were lining up to come in, and it, it was very strict policy from the government, so, from the side of the government. So I think it was in many European countries actually as well. Oh yes, in the, in the Netherlands, for instance, mm. Vesterbork was built to hold refugee German Jews. Mm. Oz in France was built. 
not just for them. There were some Spanish Republican army people who were interned there. But then when Jewish refugees began coming into France, many of them were interned there. Mm -hmm. So when the Germans came in, the camps were ready made for the became transit camps uh, to death. Um, but during the war is a harder matter. For instance, you mentioned the refugee, the, the government in exile in um, Britain. Well, the, <clears throat> the Queen of the Netherlands made a broadcast after the first uh, deportation trains rolled out of Holland and ex expressed her horror and distaste and, and on Radio Orange, which was the, the, uh, out, the, the radio service for the government in exile from the Netherlands. It made no difference to what the Germans did, and it made very little difference to the extent of D Dutch resistance. So it was harder for any, uh, even a government in exile, let alone people in Europe itself, uh, to help once the trains began to roll. Uh, and then you have this element that I said a minute ago, the tremendous temporal compression of what happened. I mean, the trains rolled with great rapidity in 1942. And that's when the great, that's when the majority of Jews were killed. Uh, and then the, the pace of the deportations slows down everywhere in 1943 and 44, with the exception of Hungary. And Hungary, there's an, there's an interesting illustration of um, the effect of bombing, because um, the trains rolled from Hungary from early May 1944 until July 9th, 1944. And one of the things that made the dictator of Hungary, Admiral Horty, stop the rolling of the trains was that the United States bombed Budapest on July 4th. Um, and that was the moment where Horty decided that he would not allow the deportation of the Jews from the city of Budapest itself. Now that bombing had some effect, but when the Holocaust was at its peak, we could not hit very many places like that. Mm. We, could, we, we could certainly hit uh, targets in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands, but we could not hit the, the death camps in Poland. They were too far away for American or British bombers to reach them. Mm. But anyway, it was an enormous deportation uh, in 1944 from Hungary. I mean, one should have thought that it wasn't possible because more than 400,000 people, it was enormous. It was a catastrophe. I mean, it was from all over Hungary. Right. And it was well known in the West. Uh, the Pope knew, the Western governments knew, and so forth. And there is no excuse for the passivity in the face of this. But there is a context in which to place it. We, we think of those deportations from Hungary in going three trains a day, sometimes as many as six. Um, and when you when we hear that, you we focus entirely on that. But of course, this was occurring in the midst of a lot of other things. And what was happening in May and June of 1944 is obviously a the preparation for the Normandy landings. Mm. A lot of American and British aircraft were concentrating on blowing up bridges and railroads so that the Germans would not be able to resupply uh, on the landing beaches. The second thing that was happening at that time is this was the high point of the V2s raining down on London. And there was a lot of concentration on um, the uh, launch pads in the Netherlands and Northern Belgium. And the third thing that was happening was the campaign on the Italian peninsula which was going very slowly and the allies were very frustrated. And so they tended to concentrate aircraft on these things that were happening at the same time. Mm. Uh, we now know that was a failure of judgment, but their eyes were diverted, if mm. you will. Mm. Mm. Uh, you've been teaching for so many years, Professor Hayes. What do you see as the most common misconception about the Holocaust showing up in public dis discussions and discourse? I think there are two. The, the first one I used to get from my students quite a lot, which was, why didn't the Jews fight back? Uh, you know, American young people uh, have a kind of heroic sense of possibilities. And um, they tend to think that a single righteous individual standing up can stop history in its tracks. And of course, this is an illusion. Um, the Jews were faced with enormous overwhelming force. Uh, 
Nobody knew what was going to happen in advance. It was very hard for them to agree on what was going to happen and then what would be the most effective way of responding to it. And, um, and of course, students are young and they don't understand the dilemmas of, for instance, being a parent. And if you, it's easy for them to think that the ghettos should have risen up spontaneously and fought back, but they've never held their own child by the hand mm. and know what that risk involves. Mm. The, other, the other great misconception that I get quite a lot nowadays, and I've been preoccupied with it lately, is the illusion that the Germans diverted enormous resources carrying out the Holocaust, or that it was difficult for them, or that it was a, a, um, an expensive process. And this is an illusion that is fostered by the fact that most people, when they think of a death camp, think of Birkenau. Mm. Because Birkenau has brick buildings, ruins of them, some of them, uh, ruins of the crematoria survive, some of the barracks survive. But the de other death camps were nothing like that. They were all built out of scavenged material in the vicinity. There was no budget. They financed themselves from what they stole from the people who arrived there. They operated for very brief periods of time. They killed with gasoline, which was cheap and readily available at, when the death camps were at their peak, or with Zyklon, which was even cheaper. The, the cost of the Zyklon to, kill, to gas over 900,000 people at Auschwitz-Birkenau works out to about one U.S. penny mm. per death in 1942. Mm. So one of the most horrible aspects of this subject, I think, and, and that people often don't understand even after they have been studying it for a while, is how easy it was for the Germans to do this. How little of their resources they devoted to it. They I, I used to say, I certainly didn't in the book, but I used to say to audiences, um, the Germans did this with their little finger. And that is a truly terrifying fact. Mm. Uh, but then what is then, I know we talked about misconception, but what is the greatest challenge when trying to convey the history of the Holocaust today to a lay audience or to anybody, I young and old? It's the greatest challenge that will never go away. How could this happen? Hmm. To be able, to be, because it seems it's such a fundamental violation. And it was a violation that occurred on a huge scale, six million people. Um, and it was done with intent by people who thought they were doing the right thing. These, these are very difficult things to comprehend and then to accept, to, to, to realize that the world can go wrong in this way so fundamentally. Uh, and I think that will always remain the greatest challenge for people in our role of introducing people to what happened. Mm. Do you have any advice to us then? We are doing research on the Holocaust in this country and all over Europe in, in in many countries, uh, what is uh, the topics that needs to be, you know, that we need to dig into still? You just, in your, in your talk, you talked about a new book on Adolf Hitler's father. And that is, of course, one uh, minor study, but there are other studies. Well, the big challenge right now is, of course, geographical, because we still don't know enough about what happened in places like Hungary, Romania, uh, Belarus, um, even Lithuania. And so you one of the You said in the old Eastern Europe then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, because and after that is all complicated the, with the political situation in those countries today. Yeah. Poland, Hungary, right. you name they it. Are, all three of those countries and Belarus also the fourth. And, and Lithuania, there is tremendous internal resistance to examining what happened because these countries see themselves as having been caught in a crossfire between communism on the one hand and their national desires uh, on the other. And in a sense, the Jews of Eastern Europe were caught in this crossfire. Um, so people who were nationalist in those regions, who thought of themselves as patriots, 
tended to think of the Jews as, and this too was malicious and a, and a, and a fantasy, but they saw the Jews as pro-communist and therefore as part of their enemies. And there was a greater willingness to collaborate with the Germans in those areas because it was collaborating was regarded as an anti-communist act and a nationalist act. It's very hard for the people in those countries now to see that as it was and to describe it as it was because the sense of shame can rise up. And, and the way they deflect the sense of shame is to deny. Mm. Mm. And so, so that is, that is one part of the, the challenge. I think for, we have to encourage people in these countries who, for, who are working in their native languages to write mm. and then to translate into our languages or, or make available to us what they're finding out. That's, that's a big part of the challenge. Um, I, that, I, then I think in every country, we all have the obligation of facing how we failed. How we failed. Mm -hmm. that, that is, uh, I, that is a, a way, ironically, that is a way of strengthening our own democracies. Mm -hmm. A way of strengthening our own political cultures is to examine in the face of this how we failed and mm -hmm. what it tells us mm -hmm. uh, for the but uh, that was the research. But do you have any advice regarding the teaching about the Holocaust now, these today in 2021 and in the years to come? Well, that, the point that I made about um, showing how easy it was to do is, I think, a very important aspect of teaching in the future. We have to show the vulnerability of societies to this kind of event, when the societies become dominated by a self-love, glorification of ourselves, and b fear, mm. uh, and because that is the that is the combustible material, and in an age right that we live in now, with so many parts of the world producing so many suffering people. We are, we are faced with issues, you know, the United States right now is faced with this issue with regard to refugees. And we are not responding any better than we did before. Um, and we have just been through a, our own minor episode of um, self-love and fear in the form of the last governing administration of this country. And so we need to study this to instruct ourselves about how to do better. Mm. Well, and you had uh, the growth of the conspiracy theories, the QAnon, and, and the storming of the Congress in your country. It's it's frightening, isn't it? It's frightening and it's humiliating. Mm. Uh, it's, it, I, I think that uh, it it is it, it's an illustration how how people can give themselves to crazed, conspiratorial, irrational explanations of the world, mm. and then believe in those things so fervently that they will inflict violence on other people. Mm. Uh, it, yeah, uh, we should certainly uh, try to sum up, but I have to ask you, Professor Hayes, that you have a new book coming up, and you've been working for many years on a study of the role of the German big business. Uh, I think especially the IG Farben in Nazi Germany, uh, what is your main findings? Can you reveal something for the audience following you now? Well, my main findings are that the moral Rubicon was crossed very early. That German industrialists, who were, after all, important, prominent, powerful people in their society, had an opportunity in 1933 to stand up to Nazi racism and they decided not to take it. And at that moment, and this was a, this was a moment when basically the, the Nazis insisted that uh, the National Association of German Industry fire all of its Jewish employees. And they were contracted employees. This would, this would have violated their labor contracts. Mm. And the Nazis threatened the, to occupy the National Association of German Industries building with stormtroopers and, until the um, dismissals occurred. And the head of German industry, Gustav Krupp von Wohlen und Halbach, uh, decided that he would acquiesce. 
mm. that he would fire. And at that moment, they and, and there were industrialists who were on the presidium of the National Association of German Industry who told Krupp, mm. if, you give, if you give in now, you will never be able to resist a government demand again. Mm. And they were right. But he decided that he would give in. And then there were successive moments when, as the phrase goes in German, the switches were thrown. Mm. The, th that was the first one in the aftermath of um, Kristallnacht. The banks become executors of government policy to seize the assets of Jews, and they willingly agree to that. Uh, then in, when the Holocaust, when the deportations begin, the Nazis are confiscating the wealth of the Jews and they are depositing this wealth in the in bank accounts of the Deutsche Bank and the Dresdner Bank. And these banks are only too happy to have the money and so on. Mm. And so at every moment where the radicalization of policy occurs, these businesses take it as, okay, this is another cost of doing business and we agree. Mm. And, and when it comes to selling Zyklon to the camps. Um, the executives of the companies that are responsible for that, both the manufacturing company and the sales company, they know what the gas is being used for, but they have more important interests at stake. They, think. Mm -hmm. they want to preserve the connection with the SS, which provides a much bigger market mm -hmm. for Zyklon than the gassing does. They want to preserve their the monopoly of the production and so forth. So people always have rationalizations about yeah. preserving their firms. Mm. That and and that's the way the process goes. And what I want to show in this book is how corrupting that is. Mm. How the how it goes step by step. How, to what degree was the persecution of the Jews and others driven by capitalist exploitation? It, it, it is driven by the desire for profit. Mm. But that, but the way in which the profit will be made is not independently devised by the capitalists. Mm. You see what I mean? So what happens is they act on their self-interest because as the context changes, their definition of self-interest changes mm. to adapt to that context. But they don't drive it. The capitalists are not saying to the Nazis, um, round up the Jews and deport them. Mm. Mm. That's not, mm. it, 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 the direction of policy comes the other way, and then the capitalists adapt. Mm. What is the title of your new book? Profits and Persecution. And when will it be published? Well, it, it should be done, because um, I'm working with a partner uh, who is writing some sections, and I'm, because I've been working on this book for 25 years. Oh my. And constantly diverted by other subjects and other books, And the literature has become so large. If I were to turn the screen a little bit, you would see that I have probably um, 20 linear feet. So what is that? Nine, eight linear meter, meters? Something like that. Something like that of studies of German corporations that have mm. appeared in the last 25 years. Okay. So I expect it'll be out in 2022, if I'm lucky. Mm. Good. Um, we should close and uh, end this uh, interesting uh, uh, conversation. Are you an optimist regarding the future for keeping the memory of the atrocities and for developing new knowledge? Yes. Um, I'm a qualified optimist. Uh, everything in the past recedes. And so memories of the past as it gets further away, always dim. But the great subjects, the subjects that reach essential moral or political exemplary questions, they endure. We are still studying the French Revolution. We're in, this, in this country, we're still studying the Civil War. Uh, these are things that have left long, if you will, tales, long after effects. I think the Holocaust is one of those subjects, and therefore people will continue to be curious, to want to know, and that will keep the subject alive. Thank you. I think that was an optimistic uh, closing, and I do wish you good health and a good working spirit over there in Chicago, Illinois.
Thank you very much. I wish I could be with you in Oslo, but this was a very pleasant substitute. Maybe you should come in 2022 and present your book at the Norwegian Holocaust Center. You're warmly welcome. I would be glad to do that. Goodbye and take care. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you.